This is not a research paper, although you can do as much research as you think is useful. Um, it is meant to be an argument with a beginning, a middle, and an end in which you give a structured response to the ideas of the course. I think that for many people, uh, it would be best to focus on some specific idea, not some marginal theme in the course, but an idea that you regard as representative of the general intentions of the argument. And then by discussing that idea, to develop your position, to develop the implications. It could be the programmatic implications about the reorganization of the market economy, or the methodological implications about a way of thinking, or even the implications with regard to the normative horizon of these arguments. And because the paper has this character, you, as I have also said before, are free to consult with one another, or indeed with anyone, whether or not that other person is in the course, uh, to share your ideas, to show even your drafts. The only restraint on such collaboration is the normal restraint in intellectual life, that you should be able to say in good faith at the end that the paper you submit is largely the expression of your own mind. So that's all I intended to say about the paper, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have about the assignment. Well, today we come to the great topic of labor and capital, which together with the relation between the vanguard the new vanguard of the knowledge economy and the rest, and with the relation of finance to the real economy, forms the heart of a progressive political economy and one of the natural focal points of any engagement today with the economic problems of the contemporary societies. I propose to divide my discussion into two parts. First, to set out the theoretical perspective from which I will engage the topic of labor and capital in the form of three propositions and of the controversies into, into which each of them leads. And then in the second part of my discussion, uh, I want to explore a programmatic response, the project uh, that this theoretical perspective helps inform. And I will distinguish in that programmatic discussion the short term, the medium term, and the long term. Remembering that in any programmatic argument, the two most important features are first that it mark a direction, and second that in a particular historical setting, it selects the initial steps by which to begin to move in that direction. So then first the theoretical perspective. The first proposition is that the reconstructed or democratized market order should be based on free labor. And this proposition then leads into the controversy about what the forms or varieties of free labor are and on what conditions the freedom of free labor depends. So there are three main forms of free work that have played a role in the development of modern ideas about work. The first is wage labor. 
labor that is bought and sold on the market. Economically dependent wage labor, that is, wage labor performed or undertaken under the constraint of necessity, is the feature that Karl Marx regarded as most definitive of capitalism. The second form of free labor is self-employment. And in some market economies in early modern Western history, like the economy of the United States in the first half of the 19th century, most men who were not slaves were self-employed. So self-employment, the condition of being smallholders, craftsmen or artisans, was the dominant form of economic activity. And the third form of free work is cooperation or partnership. And the third form really arises mainly in conjunction with the second form. Self-employment, the self-employed may cooperate. Uh, and this combination of self-employment and cooperation was the central theme of the ideas of many liberals and socialists in the 19th century. I reminded you before that although we now think that wage labor is the natural form of free labor, it wasn't really until toward the end of the 19th century that the predominant position of wage labor as an expression of free labor was accepted. For most of the 19th century, liberals as well as socialists believed that economically dependent or economically coerced wage labor was a defective form of free work, retaining many of the characteristics of serfdom and slavery, and that it was destined to give way in the course of time to the higher forms of free work, self-employment and cooperation. But this belief of the 19th century liberals and socialists, given up only very reluctantly and only very late, as I just observed, came to grief on a particular practical problem. The practical problem was how to reconcile the predominance of self-employment together with cooperation uh, with the relentless imperative of aggregation of resources at scale in a complex modern economy. And this problem, which they were unable successfully to elucidate in practice or even in theory, is related to a fundamental misunderstanding which we need to address in the debates about economic alternatives in modern history. Many have been attracted to the idea that the property right, the unified property right, largely an invention of 19th century legal theory, assembling all of the component powers of property, uh, use, usufruct, and the right to alienation, to buy and sell, would be assembled together and vested in a single right holder, the owner. And so the misunderstanding was the idea that this unified property right then, if it doesn't belong to the individual isolated owner, the so-called capitalist, could be transferred either to the state, and then there would be the state ownership of the commanding heights of the production system, or to the workers, 
and then there would be worker collectives or cooperatives, and the workers would collectively own the productive assets of society. Now, this idea failed to appreciate that the mere transfer of the unified property right from one owner to another from the capitalists to the state or to the workers would not solve the problems that the liberals and socialists wanted to address. The more difficult issue was how to reconceive the property right itself by understanding it as a bundle of rights rather than a unified right, by disassembling or disaggregating it, and by vesting its component powers in different tiers of right holders or partial owners. This is obviously a much more complicated idea than the idea of the simple transfer of the right from the capitalist to the state or to the worker. Now, one way of introducing to you, introducing you to the the question of why this is a problem, the source of the difficulty, is to think of a simple analogy in the, in the domain of agriculture, agrarian reform. So imagine a, a state that then distributes the land as the 19th century American state between independence and the Civil War in fact did distributes the land to smallholders. And then the question is, will the smallholders be free to flourish or fail, to buy or to sell the estates that they were endowed with by the state? Or will there be severe restraints on accumulation and alienation? If they are free to buy and sell, to flourish and fail, then what you could expect over time is that some will end up buying up the others. Some of these properties will expand, others will diminish, and eventually the failed smallholders will become landless peasants, hired labor for the successful ones. And then the dynamic of accumulation, or so-called capitalism, will begin all over again. On the other hand, if we impose severe restraints on alienation or accumulation, then the natural flexibility of a market economy is suppressed, and we will create the conditions for perpetual poverty, if not of the smallholders, than of the society or the economy as a whole. This is the crude form of the dilemma, the same dilemma that I said the liberals and socialists were unable to solve. A more sophisticated or subtle version of this dilemma was presented by the so-called Yugoslav regime of worker ownership in the second half of the 20th century. So we imagine that the, the right is transferred to the workers, to the worker collectives or the worker-owned enterprises, and a variation of the same problem arises. Will these worker-controlled enterprises be free to flourish and fail? to accumulate and expand, or to sell out? Or will we impose restraints of accumulation and alienation on them? And with the same consequences pointed out in the agrarian example that I just gave. Another dimension or another level of the same problem has to do with what you could call the two dynamics of running up capital and running down capital. Will they be free to increase the capital intensivity of their labor? 
reinvesting their profits in the enterprise so that their labor becomes more and more productive vis-a-vis -vis the labor of other less advantaged worker-owner enterprise. Or there could be the running down, the running down of capital. Will they, on the other hand, be free to distribute and to spend as dividends or transfers their profits? And it's even possible that these two dynamics of running up and running down can occur at the same time in different aspects of the life of the enterprise. Now, what all this suggests is the inadequacy of the simple idea of the transfer of the unified property right. This conception, this legal conception of the 19th century that there is a unified right of property that it, in principle, has unconditional scope. It is about all aspects of the use, user, fruit, and right to alienation. And it is, in principle, eternal. Because once legitimate title is established, it can be transferred by, by gifts or by inheritance. Once we accept that diminishment of the problem, we are forced to confront all of these issues that my agrarian and Yugoslav examples just suggested. The question of the, of the realism and of the appeal of the so-called higher forms of free labor, self-employment and cooperation, and their ability to displace economically dependent wage labor as the predominant form of free work seems to turn, in the end, on innovations in the property right itself. That is, in the regime, in the legal and institutional regime of decentralized access to productive resources in society. And it is a problem that cannot be solved by the simple transfer of the unified property right from one owner, the capitalist, to others, the state or the workers. So the result of that discussion, then, is to say the question of what free work is remains open. Open and unsolved, and turns on a repertoire of legal and institutional innovations that remain unfamiliar in the world. And the progressives of the 19th century and many of the progressives of the 20th and of today remain confused by these complications that I have just evoked. So, the ideal of asserting the predominance of self-employment and cooperation remains appealing. But for that appeal to work, we have to solve these unsolved problems. And the unsolved problems require a range of unfamiliar innovations that cannot be adequately achieved by the simple transfer of the unified property right from one right holder, from one owner to the other. Now let me stop there because that in itself is already perplexing uh, and complicated and ask for your questions or comments about that. Do you see what the intuitive basis of this difficulty is? A person can think, well, a statist economy is not good enough. Uh, it results in the suppression of the anarchic logic of the market, its experimentalist potential. So let's just transfer the productive assets of society to the workers. And that then is worker ownership, worker management in these collective enterprises. Now, any modern economy, 
has a hierarchical segmentation of the production system. There are capital intensive parts of the economy and labor intensive parts. Parts with uh, high technology as a result of which labor becomes very productive and other parts that are relatively unproductive. And what are we then going to do to prevent the dynamic of radical inequality and accumulation to just keep re-emerging in new forms? Will we suppress it for the sake of equality and inclusion, or will we allow it to run its course? And it seems that whichever side of this dilemma we grasp, there will be trouble. And there will continue to be trouble unless we somehow reshape the terms on which capital is made available to productive agents without being allowed to be absolute or eternal. And that then leads into the discussion of innovations in the regime of private law. This whole problem from a legal standpoint was uh, difficult for the jurists and the economists in the 20th century to penetrate, to grasp, because the whole character of the social democratic or social liberal settlement of the mid 20th century, from a legal standpoint, was to superimpose on the largely untransformed body of private law, the law of contract, of property, of delict, and of corporations, of business enterprises, a new public law of the redistributive and regulatory state. In other words, the inherited body of private law was barely touched, which means that in economic terms, the conception of the basis on which there would be economic decentralization and resources would be made available on a de in a decentralized way to the productive agents was never really reshaped or reimagined. And so we stand today uh, the victims of this legacy of unresolved problems. Would someone like to ask a question or make a comment about that? It's very important to understand this problem. Yes. Yeah, could you just explain further your, your point about the example of the Utah system or even the, the agricultural? Yes. What I'm saying is that if you don't resolve the dilemma that I've just described, you will have these perversions uh, in either of the two forms. That is, either there will be, you will retain equality and inclusion, but at the cost of, of poverty, that is, of preventing the dynamism of the economy, or, will, or you will allow market competition and differential success and failure to run their course. So it seems that either one thing or the other, uh, unless somehow you change the terms on which each of those agents has the resources at their command, making those terms in some way fragmentary, conditional, or temporary. So that takes us back to the idea that I introduced in the very first class of the course. Remember when I said, if you take um, the idea of a market economy up to the highest level of generality and abstraction, and take out of it all of its flesh, leave only the most abstract idea, it still, at that most abstract level, has at least two dimensions. One dimension is the absolute level of economic decentralization, which is the number of economic agents able, able to bargain on their own initiative and their own account. And the other dimension has to do with the absoluteness and eternity of the control that each of those agents has over the resources at their command. So, do they have absolute control? Can they do anything they want with their property? And can they have it eternally 
and even bequeath it to their descendants? Or is that right in different ways, fragmentary, conditional, or temporary? Now, the classic conception of the liberals and of the jurists in the 19th century was that these two dimensions were two dimensions of the same thing and that they were indissoluble. So absolute decentralization goes together with absolute and eternal control, perpetual control. And I said then, now, and you can see the relevance of this comment more clearly in the light of this discussion, that, those, that it's not true. Those two dimensions don't necessarily and naturally go together. In fact, they're contradictory because an obvious way in which you might be able to increase the absolute level of economic decentralization would be to make the degree of control conditional or temporary. So it's like in a simple idea, you say if there's time sharing, of some kind, more people will, be, will have access to the productive resources. Uh, or if they have the use but not the usufruct, or the use and the usufruct but not the right of alienation. So the two dimensions do not go naturally and necessarily together. And there then is the door by which to enter into a discussion that the 19th and 20th centuries didn't have which is the discussion of how we can reshape the terms on which productive resources are made available in a decentralized way to the economic agents. Yes. Uh, should we add to the dilemma the factor of productivity and efficiency of the use of this, uh, in this case, uh, resources and capital? What do you mean? Uh, because I think like when you face this dilemma, whether how to allocate resources, yes. uh, I'm thinking immediately about who is going to use the resources more efficiently, so yes. who is going to be more productive, Yes. and I think it should be part of the equation. Well, that was part, remember, of my thought experiment about the rotating capital fund, the capitalism without capitalists, in which you imagine the productive assets of society are vested in trusts. There's no discretionary allocation by the government. So if you ask the question, who owns them? In that thought experiment, the answer would be no one. No one owns them. Uh, and they can be used temporarily by those who are able to use them most efficiently. Uh, and. Now, in, in one of the remarks that I made about the Yugoslav system, the issue that you just brought up of differential productivity comes because that's what, when I described the two dynamics of running up capital and running down capital. So the workers in the worker enterprise may choose to reinvest their profits in the firm and then their labor becomes more and more productive. And in some other enterprise, the workers may want to distribute everything as much as possible, and they run down the capital, and, and so then there's a race to the bottom or a race to the top. And this is what you would normally expect in a market economy under the aegis of the unified property right. So the question is what you should do about that, if there is anything you can do about that. And the basic answer that I'm suggesting is that whatever you could do about that must have something to do with the terms of the property right, the terms on which these decentralized claims are possible. And that has to do with the legal and institutional architecture of the market order. So there's a, a, a self-subverting paradox in the idea of the liberals and the socialists of the 19th century, which is that they would deal with the problem by taking the same unified property right, the invention of the 19th century, and simply giving it to someone else. But the someone else, the state or the worker collectives, would be owners in the same sense in which the capitalist was an owner. Huh? That's what I'm suggesting seems not to work and to lead to all of these dilemmas and perversions that we're describing. 
But once we rephrase the problem in this manner, we have a vastly more complicated issue. We don't even know how to talk about it. We don't even have the analytic and legal vocabulary in which to address the disaggregation of the property right and the vesting of its component powers in different tiers of claimants on the productive resources of society. So this is really a very, uh, uh, a problem of great depth and potential. Yes. In discussing uh, the unified property right, you mentioned, I think, at least I gathered two conditions, um, that there's a right to alienation, and that's eternal. It can be transferred via gift or through inheritance. I'm wondering if um, you can sort of disrupt that idea or fragment property rights, the unified property right, without, um, without disrupting the first condition. So basically, maintaining the right to alienation, have exclusive control, but not in perpetuity. So that the state, like an example, I think Sure, that would already be a tremendous hit. I don't think it would be quite enough. Okay. Because in a, you can see how it wouldn't solve the problem of the worker collective that I mentioned. That is to say, the workers couldn't uh, bequeath their quota in the enterprise to the heirs. So what then becomes with that, to that quote, is it shared by the remaining workers? So then the remaining workers become richer and richer. You have all the other perverse dynamics that I described. That's a very partial solution. So when I mentioned use, usufruct, and alienation, it was simply a handy way of evoking what is involved in the disaggregation of the property right because it's the traditional conception of the civil law, of the civilian tradition. Property has these three powers, use, usufruct, and alienation. And that's how a civilian would naturally think of the aggregation or disaggregation of property. But it's not the best vocabulary. It's just three conceptions. And there are many other ways in which you can imagine the property right to be cut up made fragmentary, made conditional. We're familiar with this, as I mentioned before in discussing finance, because modern finance markets, capital markets, are, mar are very largely markets in derivatives of the property right. The term derivatives uh, uh, comes from this, language, this legal language. They are derivatives of the unified property right. That's what it means. It's not the whole property right, it's a second or third level. And so that activity of unpacking the bundle and conceiving of its component powers in different ways and vesting them in different right holders can be imagined in all sorts of ways. We're not restricted to this civilian vocabulary of use, user, fruit, and alienation. That was just a, 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 a deliberate simplification to use the civilian nomenclature to evoke the problem of the disaggregation of the property right. Now, it's, now there's, a, there's a movement now in the American law schools, the so-called new private law. Uh, which criticizes this idea of the disaggregation of the property right. And they criticize it by saying that the proponents of the idea of disaggregation don't appreciate that property has a structure that's not just amorphous. But it, that's a misunderstanding of what's at stake in the argument. The problem is not that property has no structure or has a structure. The problem is that it has too many possible structures. There's not one necessary structure. That's what's involved in this argument. So we could set out to have a market order in which we retain the unified property right for certain economic activities. I said before, it has a big advantage. It, its advantage is to allow someone, the owner and investor, to do something that no one else believes in without having to negotiate some consensus among a range of economic agents. 
but it has all these problems that we discussed. So then there would be other parts of the production system in which we would allow for a disaggregation of the rights so that workers, local governments, local communities uh, could have certain limited claims on the governance of the productive resources alongside investors. And that would be, then uh, the disaggregation of the property right would take another form. So the idea is, contrary to the Hayekian fundamentalist thesis, the market order has no single natural and necessary form. And there's no reason why we have to imagine it fastened to the cross of a single dogmatic version of itself. We can imagine that different ways of organizing the decentralized allocation of economic resources and therefore different regimes of contract property and business enterprise come to coexist experimentally in the same market order. And that's then a different, a, a different direction. And this was the agenda that was not opened up in the last two, two centuries with all the consequences that we now see. Now, the second thesis that I want to use to establish this theoretical perspective is the thesis that there should be an upward tilt to the returns to labor. Uh, and the basic idea is that the upward tilt is not just for the sake of equality and inclusion, it's for the sake of innovation and growth. We know that when there is a downward tilt to the returns to labor, productivity suffers. The extreme case is a slave economy. There's no innovation when labor is for free. Innovation occurs under economic pressure when labor is relatively scarce and the price of labor is tilted upward. Uh, and that idea, this second proposition, then leads into another debate. And the debate is about the division of national income between capital and labor, another momentous subject in economics. So one of the most uh, enduring and entrenched theses of practical economics is that the wage, the return to labor, cannot sustainably rise above the rise of productivity. That it will be undone, it will subvert itself, most notably by inflation. So for example, according to this thesis, any attempt to decree a rise in the nominal wage will quickly be undone because the rise will turn out to be nominal and not real. Inflation will undo the rise. The only thing that sustains a persistent rise in the returns to labor is the rise in productivity. Now, this conventional idea of practical economics is at best a half-truth uh, for the following reasons. It's absolutely true that if we just decree a rise in the nominal wage, uh, minimal wage legislation, for example, all by itself, the result will be precarious. Uh, it will be undone sooner or later by inflation. It won't stick. But that's not the serious argument. The serious argument is whether there's some set of institutional initiatives advantaging the power of workers vis-a-vis via, via the asset holders, the so-called capitalists, which can impose this upward tilt to the returns to labor. Now, it is a fact that when we compare economies uh, at comparable levels of economic development and control 
for differentiating factors, such as the so-called factor endowments, whether they're rich or poor in natural resources, what their demographic profile is, and so forth, we find that there are astonishing differences, that countries at a comparable level of economic development, when we control for these differences in factor endowments, divide national income between capital and labor in very different ways. Uh, and how could these differences have arisen in the first place if there is this iron law governing the returns to labor, that they can only rise in proportion to the rise in productivity? How, how could these differences have been established to start with? if there is this iron law. And it seems that there's no persuasive explanation of these differences that doesn't take into account the differential power, the bargaining power, the strike power uh, of the workers vis-a-vis -vis the owners of the assets. And that those differences have a decisive influence on the division of national income. So, for example, in the North Atlantic economies, in the rich North Atlantic economies, including, of course, the United States, from the 1970s on, on the whole, the rise in the real wage lagged far behind the rise in productivity. So how can we think that it can't go above the rise in productivity, but it can go below and it can go below for a sustained time. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, so the revised version of the thesis would be to say, there is no natural and necessary division of national income between workers and asset owners. Any attempt to modify that division by the simple legislation of a different nominal wage will tend to fail. But the institutional initiatives that change the correlation of forces between workers and asset holders has a very different prospect. Uh, and that's therefore what we should bet on from the standpoint of this idea of imposing an upward tilt to the returns to labor. Uh, now, of course, it's difficult to measure, and it seems that the closest statistical proxy to the Marxist conception of surplus value is the relation of the wage to value added in the industrial sector. And if we take a statistical proxy like that one, we do find that there are these remarkable contrasts among the modern economies. So again, I stop and ask you whether you have some question about that second proposition. I come to the third proposition. The third proposition is no one should be condemned to do work that can be done by a machine. And this proposition, in turn, points to controversies about the nature and evolution of technology, and whether the evolution of technology has or does not have an imminent logic that shapes its direction. So I suggest two main ways in which we can think about technology. They're not contradictory. They complement each other. One way of thinking about technology is Technology is the, is the materialization of a channel between our experiments in the mobilization of natural forces for our benefit and our experiments in the organization of cooperation, especially cooperation in work, in, in labor. What we mean by technology is simply the material form of that relation. 
So the mobilization of natural force is nothing mysterious, like, for example, electricity, the electrical forces. And in the design of machines, that mobilization of natural forces becomes related to a way of organizing the technical division of labor, our cooperation in production. That's the first way of thinking of technology. The second way of thinking of technology is it marks the division, the boundary, the movable boundary between the repeatable and the not yet repeatable. So this is the idea that I evoked earlier in the course. Everything that we have learned how to repeat, we can express in a formula or an algorithm. And then we can embody the formula or the algorithm in a mechanical device, the machine. So the machine does for us what we have learned how to repeat. And in principle, the point of the machine would be to allow us to preserve our supreme resource, our time, for, for the not yet repeatable, with the understanding that what we can repeat is changes over time. Now, there's a complication in this formulation, in this way of thinking, which is that the capabilities of machines become stronger and stronger over time. And now it seems that there is a generation of mechanical devices that is able to pass directly from complex data to, the, to, the, to its use, its analytic and practical consequences, without passing through an intermediate level of formulas or algorithms that are made explicit. And this is what we find, for example, in the use of artificial intelligence to translate natural languages into one another without having first formulated general rules of grammar and syntax. Now, what stands behind this second approach to technology? that it marks the frontier of the repeatable, is an idea of the mind. And I can state that idea very simply in the following terms. The mind has two sides. In one side, the mind is like a machine. It is modular and formulaic. But in another side, the mind is an anti-machine. It's not like a machine. It's not modular and not formulaic. It enjoys the power that in mathematics we call recursive infinity, the ability to combine everything with anything else. And above all, it has the transgressive and transcending power, the negative capability of discovering something which it doesn't yet know how to make sense of. And retrospectively, formulating the methods and the rules of inference that allow it to make sense of what it has discovered. And this is the faculty that we call the imagination. Now for Kant, for Immanuel Kant, the crucial move of the imagination was distancing from the phenomena. So if the phenomenon is present to consciousness, we can't imagine it. An image is the memory of a perception. But this is not, to my mind, the crucial move of the imagination. The crucial move of the imagination is a second move. It is the subsumption of the phenomenon under a range of possible variations in the domain of the adjacent possible. What can happen next? What we can turn that into, what it can turn into under certain conditions or provocations. That's how we understand things. That's how we understand anything. We understand something, we have insight into it to the extent that we can understand what it can next become. <laughs> 
If we have no transformative insight, we have no insight, period. We're not understanding the phenomenon, we're simply staring at it. And then there's retrospective rationalization in the place of insight. So this conception then of what technology is, of what it can become, then leads into the positive project of saying, what do we desire? What we desire is the combination of the machine and the anti-machine. What is the anti-machine? The anti-machine is the human being, the mind, in the exercise of its transformative imaginative powers. Now, there is nothing in the physical constitution of the brain that determines the relative powers of these two sides of the mind, the machine side and the anti-machine side. The relative power the relative presence of these two sides of the mind is determined by the organization of society and of culture, which then give more or less space to one or another form of the, mi of the mind. And this is the sense in which can, we can say that the history of politics is internal to the history of the mind. Now, all of this, these theoretical preliminaries, then go to the to the end of, of saying that what we, what, what we should desire of technology, given this, this, these conceptions, which I've just stated, is that over time, it help us organize this partnership of the machines and the human beings so that the machines come to enhance the power of the human beings rather than just to replace them. Machines always will replace human labor to some extent, but they should also be able to enhance human labor. And then the partnership between the machine and the anti-machine will be much more powerful than either of them would, would be all by itself. So machines already have much greater computational power than human beings can have. But the question is, what is the role of the imagination? And how can they partner with us in the exercise of our imaginative powers? Now, given all of that as a theoretical background, my main claim, then, is that technology has no inherent, imminent logic of evolution. Its logic of evolution is the logic that we give it. And our interest is to give it the direction of enhancing labor as well as of replacing it, rather than of just replacing it. So those are the three propositions from which I propose to approach the question of the relation of labor to capital. And let me again stop and ask for your questions and comments. Yes? So I imagine, I mean, I'm, I'm taking a few steps beyond your last proposition and imagining that you are helping us think about a world where um, working people, all of us, aren't condemned to do boring, repetitive jobs because the machines will do that and we can have imaginative, creative jobs. So the quality, the, so it goes back to this fundamental hope that I have uh, stated at different points in the argument in the course, that we, we can hope for freedom in the economy and not just from the economy. As Marx and Keynes said, just freedom from the economy, work is a hateful burden. Uh, and we can hope for more. So it is related to that. And it is related then to a contrast among 
three ideas of work, three moral ideas of work that have played a role in modern history. So first, work as, as an honorable calling in which the, the, the person gains a living, a sustenance, but also respect and self-respect from having a particular trade or profession. Then there's a second is work as purely instrumental, under the lash of economic necessity. And the third is the idea of work as a transformative vocation. We transform ourselves by transforming the world. Now, up to now in history, that third idea has been the prerogative of an elite, not particularly an economic elite, but a spiritual elite. And so, in the end, one question is how this third idea of work, the higher form of work of its creative, non-repetitious character, can gradually become a common possession of humanity rather than remaining the prerogative of an elite. So, I keep, keep bumping up against forms of work that I feel resist that, um, but that I would like to be treated with dignity and that possibly can't be mechanized. And I think about a lot of, you know, what Marx called reproductive labor, child raising and house Absolutely, care. so personal care, what you could call the caring yeah. economy. Right. Uh, and it has this non-formulaic character, but it, but it doesn't satisfy the formula of the elitist formula of creativity. True. But it's not something that we have so far adequately replaced by machines. Now, as you know, there's some ex discussion and experiment of the world in which about the ways in which machines, specifically robots, can play a useful role in that caring economy. But there's the intangible element, precisely of commitment, of personal commitment and devotion, for which the machines are inadequate substitutes. So I guess, how do we preserve I mean, I don't think that machines are an adequate substitute. I'm sure we, you're referring, maybe referring to an article we all just saw the other day in the New York Times about robots caring for the elderly in Italy, um, you know, among many such things. But I don't think most of us think that that's an adequate solution for the problem of the caring economy. Yeah. And so we're, when we're replacing the boring stuff with machines and elevating the interest, allowing more of us to do the interesting stuff, who does the the caring work, and how does it, how do we assure that it maintains its dignity and, and you know, good... Well, work? but we're mixing up your stages of my argument, so okay. I think this is a very important issue, and this role of personal care in the contemporary economy, is, it has great significance, but for the moment, all I've done with these three propositions is design the theoretical perspective from which I want to engage this debate about free work, and the next one to come to the programmatic implications. Huh? Someone here had a question? Yes. Um, you, you distinguish between, uh, I think, two general forms of technology, technology that replaces labor and technology that enhances it or makes it more productive. Yes. In terms of the former that replaces, are, are, are you arguing that there, no, that there are no technologies that replace labor that are beneficial, um, I think of like... No, every technology replaces labor to some extent. The, 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 the replacement of labor is part of the central function of technology. So, and even tools, like when agriculture was first established in civilization, it was associated with tools to till the ground. That's a replacement of labor. And that has always been true of technology. It's not going to stop being true. I'm not asking whether it's true or not, whether you think that it's a good thing or a bad thing. And I guess That's a good thing. Of course it's a good thing. Because typically the activities that are replaced are the, re the formulaic repeatable activities. And we want them to be replaced. As we want the element of the non-formulaic element in our conscious life 
to increase. So now there, yes? While, while acknowledging that there will be elements of the economy, such as the service sector, that maybe that, that machines cannot replace labor with, um, do you think that there's, evolutionarily speaking, that technology becomes so advanced that we just have to deal with the fact that there may not be enough jobs for, for laborers and we have to sort of reconcile that? Or do you think we, it, we have to exclusively focus on technology that advances the producti productivity of labor? I'm not sure. There seems to be a contradiction between what you said at the end and what you said before. I'm not understanding. So I think we, we don't know how far the evolution of technology can go in replacing labor. And there's this nightmare in which it could replace most labor. And now this, this violates a, 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 a conventional thesis of economics. And for once, a thesis which I think is on the whole sound, which is the rejection of the fixed fund theory of jobs. That is, that there's a fixed stock of jobs, and if they're destroyed, the total number of jobs is gone forever. That hasn't been the characteristic of technological evolution up to now. When some, when some jobs are destroyed, others are created, because the evolution of technology then pushes the frontier of our capabilities and generates new activities. That's what it's been like up to now. Now, we have no guarantees that we'll continue forever to be like that. And so we can't say with certainty what the outer limits to this replacement function will be. But what, but what we can say is that up to now, it, it has had this potential for creating even as it destroys. Uh, but that's not where I would advocate we should invest our energies. We should invest our energies in trying to shape the evolution of technology so that it doesn't just replace, but it also enhances. It changes the character of what we do, and it makes it more complex, more varied, more interesting, more open to a range of forms of human excellence. Because our interest is, while the reign of scarcity persists, to create the possibility of freedom in the economy and not just from the economy. That's the basic idea. And the basic idea contends with this fear, which you just stated, uh, that uh, the work is simply going to disappear. Never happened up to now. The more tangible fear is that the instruments of technology will replace labor and that they will be owned by a small elite of asset owners. As one of the pieces in the reading says, the robots will be owned all by this elite and it will be the interest of the elite to a, relinquish having to deal with the problems of labor, the political problems as well as the narrowly economic problems. Now we come to the programmatic discussion. And in the programmatic discussion, the first focus has to be on the short term, on the immediate. And in dealing with the immediate, we have to distinguish between two parts of the labor market the organized part and the unorganized part. The organized part in the advanced economies would be the unionized part, the part in which the workers are, are collectively organized. But in most economies in the world, in the developing economies, a major part of the labor force is in the so-called informal economy. So there are two different phenomena. There's the, in, the, the rise of the informal economy, and then in the formal economy, the rise of precarious employment, 
vis-a-vis -vis stable employment. Now, let me focus first on the organized part. The organized part is now a minority. It's a minority in every economy in the world. So now in the rich countries, the part of the labor force that is unionized is a minority and a rapidly declining minority. Unionization prevails, persists mainly in public employment and in the so-called third sector, in work for the philanthropies, for the charities. Uh, now, there have been two labor law regimes in the 20th century. The contractualist or corporatist or collective bargaining regime, which has prevailed in most of the rich countries, and the corporatist regime, which was first formulated in fascist Italy in the Carta del Lavoro in 1927, but then adopted by populist industrializing governments in Latin America in the course of the 20th century. So the two central characteristics of the contractualist regime are first, that the decision to unionize is purely voluntary the workers unionize or not. It's an instance of freedom of contract. And second, that the unions are completely independent from the state. And the two dominant characteristics of the corporatist labor law regime are the inverse of those. So everyone is automatically unionized according to his position in the production system. <coughs> sector by sector, and secondarily, by territory, everyone is unionized. And second, the unions are part of the state. They're quasi-state organizations, typically working under the tutelage of a ministry of labor, which is then the instrument of the government to control the union structure. Now, although collective bargaining, the contractual regime, has become predominant. It has many defects from the standpoint of the democratization of the market order. The first defect is that it absorbs the energy of the workers in the struggle to unionize and leaves very little left over for what is to be done with their power once they acquire it. The second defect is that in a hierarchically segmented production system, the union structure tends to echo, reflect, reinforce the underlying inequalities in the production system. In the capital-intensive parts of the production system, the workers and the owners, or capitalists, the managers, have common interests against everyone else. The wage bill is a relatively small part of the total cost of the enterprise. Uh, and the third defect of the collective bargaining regime is that it tilts the focus of union militancy away from larger institutional or political issues to purely economistic demands for wages and benefits. So in principle, what would be the best solution? The best solution, it seems to me, would be in principle a hybrid regime that took from the corporatist regime the principle of complete independence of the unions from the state but took from the contractualist, that took from the contractualist regime the principle of complete independence of the unions from the state, but took from the corporatist regime the principle of automatic and inclusive unionization. In other words, everyone would automatically be unionized, but the union structure would be completely independent of governmental influence, and different movements within the union structure 
affiliated or not to political parties, would then compete for position in this unitary union structure, just like political parties in a democratic state compete for position in the unitary structure of government. <coughs> now, I have to say that it seems like it's too late for that. Because the decline of unionization now has now reached such a point, an irretrievable point, that this may be a solution for a world that no longer exists. And for the same reason, I think, that the attempt to reignite the power of the unions may be largely a lost cause in these economies. Given the replacement of Fordist mass production by the insular knowledge economy, the present form of the productive vanguard. And therefore, our focus has to shift from the organized sector to the unorganized one, the secondary part of the labor market, which is now predominant in all the economies of the world rich economies and developing economies. So there, there is an emergency problem. The emergency problem is the rise of precarious labor, labor that is temporary or insecure in different ways. There are now two main discourses about labor in the world. There is the neoliberal discourse that preaches maximum flexibility in the labor market. And under the mantra of flexibility, wants to abandon the majority of the labor force to precarious employment. And then there is the syndicalist discourse, the discourse of the union leaders and of the left, of much of the traditional left, of the defense of the traditional labor law regime the contractualist labor law regime, which in its real situation now represents the interests of a minority, of relatively privileged and stable workers, to the detriment of the interests of the disorganized majority of the labor force. That's the syndicalist discourse. The temptation of the syndicalist discourse is to try and prohibit, by decree as it were, all these new forms of relations of production that involve pseudo self-employment as a disguised form of wage labor and conditional or temporary labor in different kinds. Just to say that they're illegal because they're a fraudulent circumvention of the labor law. Uh, as if one could, by decree, by fiat, uh, somehow roll back this change in the economic realities, in the nature of the economic vanguard. Those are the two discourses. And by opposition to those two discourses, then I want to say that what we should prefer is to create alongside the inherited body of labor law, the collective bargaining system for the organized minority, a second labor law regime that attempts to master in law this new economic reality without simply decreeing its illegality uh, in the way that I just described. So what then would be the basic character of this second labor law regime for the secondary part of the labor market, that is, the unorganized part of the labor market? You can imagine that there would be like a sliding scale. And you would say, we would attempt to use the new information and technology, information and communication technologies to organize as much as possible this disorganized majority. And to the extent that it could be organized and represented, 
then there wouldn't have to be direct legal intervention in the employment relation. But to the extent that we didn't succeed in organizing it, there would be direct legal intervention in the employment relation. And the general point of the direct legal intervention would be to distinguish between legitimate economic flexibility and illegitimate radical economic insecurity or the cheapening of labor. Remembering that second proposition that we want to impose an upward <coughs> tilt to the returns to labor in order to secure the dynamic of in socially inclusive innovation. So how would we do that? We could do that, for example, by insisting on a principle of price neutrality in the competition between stable and unstable work. So work performed under conditions of precarious, unstable employment would have to be remunerated at a level comparable to the level of similar work undertaken under conditions of stable employment. And that would be a device by which we would attempt to distinguish flexibility from insecurity and the cheapening of labor. But this would be only the first step in a whole project, in a whole attempt to establish, as it were, a second code of labor law, of labor relations, to govern this new economic reality rather than either to imagine that we could suppress it entirely or treat it as a free-for-all. So this is what I would say about the short term, given all of those theoretical propositions I stated at the start, uh, that the hybrid regime that I described as the most attractive solution in the short term to the problem of unionization uh, is probably no longer feasible as a solution to the basic problem of the majority. As I say, the, the time for that seems to have passed. And therefore, we need to face the reality of precarious employment, of radical insecurity, and of the cheapening of labor, because it imposes a vast burden on this dynamic of economic uplift that we would want to stage. So what do you think of that, for, of the, of that short term? Uh, so I guess one thing that may seem strange is this idea that for the organized, you could have a solution and you would think that would be a good solution, but it's too late. There are a number of people who now advocate unionization or reunionization in these economies. And it seems to me to be largely a lost cause. Uh, and then there's this reality of temporary employment, unstable employment, which then proposed by neoliberalism as inevitable. And we need to distinguish what in it is truly inevitable, and what represents a perversion that we can master through a different set of legal rules, legal employment. All of this, in some way, is a vindication of the basic idea that what free work means is not self-evident. And that depends on a solution to all of these problems that we're discussing. What do you think? Yes. I just have a clarification question regarding the direct, direct legal interventions that you're mentioning. Those yes. are outside the umbrella of the formal. So, practice. direct legal intervention, let me clarify the term direct legal intervention. So, direct legal intervention by contrast to countervailing power. So, the basic idea of the collective bargaining regime is countervailing power. 
Uh, so in the employment relation, there is radical inequality of bargaining power between the workers and the owners, the capitalists, as they're called. And the idea is the inequality of bargaining power is so stark that the reality is the reality of what the jurists call economic duress. And economic duress threatens to turn the contractual facade of the employment relation into a sham. Behind that facade, the reality is coercion. And so the, the, the bet that the collective bargaining regime makes is organize the workers so that collectively they, their, their bargaining power will be enhanced and the reality of contract will be reestablished. That's the idea. And uh, I earlier remarked on all of the defects of the collective bargaining regime, which are not acknowledged by its ideologists. Uh, Direct legal intervention in the employment relation has to do with the attempt by the state to set certain terms of the employment relation, like the wage, the price, when countervailing power appears not to be enough to redress the evils of economic duress. That's what it means. And so in this context now, which is not the context of Fordist mass production and uh, collective bargaining, but the context of the new insular knowledge economy uh, in which the majority is not unionized. Uh, direct legal intervention in employment relations means an attempt to compensate for the consequences of the precariousness. That's what it means. Yes. I just wanted to clarify what you meant by um, insisting on the principle of price neutrality between stable and unstable work. Yeah. Would that be an argument that those who have secured these relatively more privileged, organized positions should be getting essentially the same uh, benefit as those who are not? Or what would that so, be? So, so, in, so one of the problems of this situation of precarious employment is the cheapening of the wage. So when work is made precarious, the assumption would be other things be equal, the return to labor goes down. And the cheapening to wage presents an economic as well as a social problem, given the arguments in favor of the attempt to impose this upward tilt to the returns to labor. That was the idea. So, can we find a way of distinguishing flexibility, legitimate flexibility, from undesirable cheapening of the wage? Uh, and that then animates this idea of intervening in the employment relationship to prevent the situation of temporary labor or precarious labor from resulting in the cheapening of the wage. So it's a reaction, and I call it an emergency reaction, to this situation of these societies. Now, you have to remember that this whole problem that we're dealing with has to be understood in the context of the change in the mode of production, the subject we discussed earlier in the courts of the insular knowledge economy. So collective bargaining was made for a different world. It was made for the world of Fordist mass production. Its presupposition is there's a stable labor force assembled in large productive units like factories under the aegis of major corporate entities. And then we have collective bargaining. Those workers can easily be unionized and represented. There'll be countervailing power in the relations between organized labor and big business and so forth. Now we have a world in which conventional industry survives, I said, either as a vestige of the earlier vanguard or as a satellite to the new vanguard. 
uh, undertaking the commoditized part of the process of production that is subcontracted to it by the new vanguard. The new vanguard is often fabulous. It has no physical factories. And it then farms out work. It subcontracts work to other parts of the world. So this is what you can call a new putting out system. So Karl Marx describes in the early chapters of Das Kapital the putting out system in England. The capitalist in, early, in the early modern mechanized manufacturing gives the sewing machine to the, 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 to, to the worker. The worker works at home with his family and friends with the material and the machines provided by the capitalist. That's the putting out system. Now we, we have what you could describe as a new putting out system on a global scale. Uh, and that's the system in which conventional industry survives as the satellite and is used by the advanced firms of the vanguard to do the commoditized part of production. Uh, and so that's a different world. And the defenders of traditional unionization then can be accused of proposing a 20th century solution to a 21st century problem. The underlying realities of production have changed. That seems to me to be the weak point of the, what I call the syndicalist discourse of let's declare all of these forms of temporary uh, or precarious employment illegal because they are a fraudulent circumvention of the labor laws. And we can't do that. We can't, by decree, annul the change in the economic realities. What we can do is to try and change the direction of the economic realities themselves. That was the whole argument about an inclusive knowledge economy. But in the meantime, we have to, we have to care about this emergency problem right now, which is the problem of precarious labor. And it's. And it's really remarkable when you think of it. The social democratic parties of the West, especially the European social democratic parties, have their historical base in the organized labor force in capital intensive parts of the economy, especially in conventional industry. So they would have to have a discourse about this. But they don't have a discourse about this. So this part of the labor force is shrinking. It, it uh, increasingly comes to be seen by the rest of society as just this one more special interest group, rather than as the bearer of the universal interests of society. And it comes to see itself that way. And then its leaders then attempt to build themselves into that niche, and as I said before, buy a few more years for this declining mass production industry. And what's the alternative for them? The alternative for them is either to go down with this ship, uh, tying themselves to this shrinking minority with its special interests, or to cut their links and then become a kind of generic middle class quality of life party. So this has happened to one social democratic party in the West after another, uh, as opposed to this idea that they would face the reality of the insular knowledge economy and a precarious labor that goes with it and try to change it. And that's the, that's the enormous task, the enormous challenge, uh, and which it remains unaccomplished, right? I mean, you must all have opinions about this. This is, this is the stuff of contemporary politics. And yes? It seems to me, in describing the problem of precarious labor, that there's this paradox. And correct me if I'm misreading this, but the precariousness of the labor is connected to the idea that in a previous Fordist economy, labor as a whole has an intrinsic value, but its problem is that it's fragmentary. So you unionize into a group so that, so that capital Capital well, stop, labor. stop there for a moment. What do you mean by an intrinsic value? So, so labor, 
has a utility on its own. But the problem in a forced economy is that if it's fragmented, and capital owners have the ability to fragment it into groups and trade one group against another, they can divide the value of labor. So unionizing a group makes it more indivisible, and therefore there's a collective power to collective bargain. So, but that would be, that wouldn't be an argument in favor of collective bargaining. No, that would be an, ar an argument in favor of the revised form of the corporatist regime that I described, wouldn't the it? Prob the problem that I'm reading is that the precarious labor problem is that the competition with precarious labor isn't with other labor, it's with technology. So a legal instrument to protect precarious labor would only further drive the problem of making labor precarious by <clears throat> forcing corporations or capital owners to invest more in technology or other means to replace that labor rather than compete. Am I misunderstanding that? So you're saying that when I call this direct legal intervention in the employment relation would make it even more attractive for the asset owners to increase the capital intensity of their enterprises in well, order to get rid of the problem of labor. I think the obvious example, if you think about like cashiers at, at, uh, at stores, uh -huh. if you create an illegal instrument to protect the value of their labor, would that not drive corporations to create technological solutions to replace the labor? If that were the only thing that were happening, it would, of course. Uh, and I agree with you. But I think that has to be seen in the context of the larger struggle over the creation of a knowledge economy for the many and over the larger struggle to redirect the direction of technology, which is the subject I come to next. So in the middle, so this is all the short term, right? Uh, so in the middle term, it seems to me that the predominant issue is the one you just mentioned, the, the direction of technology. And the idea is that the state, in, in attempting to participate in the building of a democratized market order, has an interest in <coughs> shaping the evolution of technology so that it doesn't just replace labor, but it also enhances labor. And how could it implement this interest? In the short term through tax incentives and disincentives, for example. But it would have to also participate in the development of technology so that the technology was repackaged or redirected in a form which would serve this goal of the enhancement of labor. So the, the state already participates very heavily in the evolution of the vanguard of technology in every economy in the world, including in the United States, through, or through for example, through the military industrial complex, through the defense complex. Uh, but the state could, would, would, would then have to engage in the activity of reshaping, for example, artificial intelligence, so that artificial intelligence was made available in, in a form that could be assimilated by the relatively backward, small and medium-sized firms of the existing economy and by the individual economic agents. The ones whom I suggested earlier in the course, we should want to transform into technologically equipped artisans. Uh, and that's not just a mechanical activity of preferring some technologies to others. It's an activity which requires the repackaging and the development of technologies that don't yet exist or don't exist in the form in which we would want them to exist. So the basic premise of this argument is that technology has no imminent logic of evolution. It doesn't automatically go in one direction or another. Its logic of evolution is the logic that we give it or that it acquires in a particular institutional framework. Uh, and that's the answer to your question. I think that the, the attempt to reshape the direction of technology is only really plausible if it's part of a larger operation. Uh, 
And the larger operation is the construction of the knowledge economy for the many, uh, in which we, we, we imagine a 21st century industrial equivalent to 19th century agricultural extension, an uplift of the rear guard, both in the form of the rear guard as firms and the rear guard as individual economic agents. And then technology emerges then as the component of that process, uh, rather than as uh, somehow a separate activity. So in the light of that, what, how, how would you respond? So it appears to me that the real challenge, the, sh the short term challenge is almost to, to, to your earlier point, a foregone problem that has passed us. And the real challenge on the horizon is a midterm challenge because the, the problem that you're describing seems like a qualitative problem in the workforce. If, if the fundamental problem is increasing the value of the wage earner so that they- Right, qualitative problem in the sense of their cognitive and operational capabilities, is that what you mean? Or some variation, right? So what are the obstacles to, to the workforce in, in embracing a technological solution to enhance their value? That seems to me like a qualitative problem, where either the technology is too complex for the work, workforce to use, or the worker is not- Well, not the technology is clearly too complex for the workforce as now established to use in its present form. So the technology has to be reestablished. Going back to the agricultural example, the land-grant colleges didn't just mechanically bring the most recent agricultural innovations to the farmer. They reformed those innovations so that the farmers could assimilate them, could use them. That is, they, they, they redid them in a form that made them accessible. And that would be part of the task of the state. The nature of education has to be changed, of course. The different model of technical education. It's not technical education as conceived in the old German model of job-specific and machine-specific skills for a defined repertoire of conventional trades. It's higher level conceptual and practical capabilities for the masses of workers. Uh, so all of that is part of it, yes. And so it's, it's, a, it's a huge task. And if you think of it as going all together, it can seem intimidating as if it were a system, which you either do all at once and all together or not at all. But it's not like that. But therefore, the qualitative problem in the mid-range is disconnected from the short-term problem, which is precarious work. So failure in the short-term But term why, but that's what I'm not understanding. Why is it disconnected? Well, so, so if we say, for example, the qualitative, building a qualitative solution to the workforce is not contingent necessarily on the short-term interventions required to solve the problem of precarious work. It's not, not, con one. not contingent. So if, if there's a huge pressure to cheapen labor, that pressure in and of itself is already an onus, a burden on innovation, and on, especially on innovation that's inclusive. Uh, so we want to maintain this upward tilt to labor. We would want to take these economic agents who have lost stable connections to the business enterprises and lift them up. That's what I call transforming them into technologically equipped artisans. So I suppose that would all come under the rubric of your qualitative transformation. But the attempt to master the economic and legal realities of precarious labor don't seem to me to contradict that, except with respect to the theme that you earlier mentioned, that if the raising of the wage occurs as if it were isolated, then that in and of itself increases the incentive for the entrepreneur to find a way to have no workers whatsoever. Uh, or to find workers who are only in some remote country with a much lower tax burden and a much lower wage burden than he has at home. So that's all part of, that's all part of the reality. So to me now, based on that description, I envision kind of to connect the two ideas together, the, the useful instrument would be one whereby the instrument 
incentivizes corporations to develop technology that, that expands the capability of existing workers. Yes. And then therefore those workers can now spread their productivity across a broader sector. No, but it's not just incentivizing corporations, it's for the state in its own name, through its own agencies, through its own instrumentalities, to develop these technologies, to repackage them. It's not just in, to act indirectly through the corporations. Of course, in the United States, that's always the preference. But in the world generally, that would not be, the, that would not be what would first occur. The state directly would do this. Uh, and in, even in the United States, in the area of technologies that emerge from the defense complex, the state has done that. That's where many of these technologies come from. But then the next text, the next task is to popularize them in some form. So I don't see that as something, simply something that the state would do through the corporations. The state would do that through its own instruments. Uh, Quasi-governmental organizations, they could be parastatal, as the organizations established in the New Deal in the United States were, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac for the mortgage market. And there, and there are many countries in the world uh, that have such organizations. For example, in my country in Brazil, it's one of the few countries in the world in which the state has a vast array of instruments for such a project. We have the public development banks. We have an organization called Sebrae that is designed to lift the capabilities of the small and medium-sized firms, the practices. Then we have networks of technical schools that are parastatal. We have many of the tools. Paradoxically, what we don't have is the project. In most countries, the opposite occurs. They have the project, and then they have to go looking for the tools. So, but, but in, in, in either event, it seems to me, the state would be acting on its own motion as the instrument of the collective understanding that technology does not direct its own future. We direct the future of technology, and we do so by establishing obliquely incentives and disincentives or by acting directly through the instrumentality of the state. And of course, then, the nightmare is that somehow a world arises in which the technologies abolish the need for most labor altogether. And uh, those technologies are then owned by a small elite. That small elite owns the technologies that render labor superfluous. That has never happened in history up to now, which is, of course, not a reason why it could not happen, uh, and given Alfred North Whitehead's observation that the business of the future is to be dangerous. Yes? Louder, please. Uh, couldn't we argue that what we said for the unions, that it's already too late for them, uh, is also applicable to the states, that it's already too late for them? And uh, by that, I mean that already most of the technologies and the new ones are in the hands of uh, a very small elite, a very small number of uh, big tech companies, and that the states uh, do not have the... the the capability, the, the, the persons uh, who are able to, to harness the, the, the technology and they do not have the vision either. Because of course, uh, let's, uh, and it, it's true that- uh, But those are two different statements, right? One statement is saying the te technologies don't exist. Of course they don't exist. They have to be redirected or recreated. But then you say, but the state doesn't have the vision. Well, that's a problem of a completely different order. Let it get the vision. But what I'm, what I'm saying is that they don't have the vision because they don't have the right people to serve that vision. The and state? Yeah, the state. Well, but who, what, what, country are you, what, what country are you thinking about? Oh, no. 
<laughs> but even I mean, what I'm thinking, I, I mean, even here in the United States, if we like, if we see how the market is, and uh, it's all about big tech company really holding the, the the technology. And if if I'm going to go even further, I would even argue that that we have reached. We have reached a point where the technology has been so much disruptive that it's not so much what disruptive, dis disruptive uh -huh. that we are not because like in the in the nineteenth century or with the industrialization it was all about um, to organize um, the labor but here it, with artificial intelligence we are going even further. It's not about how we are organized the economy. It's also how about we are like it has real impact in our intellectual intellectual um, uh, capacity as human beings. It, but you're conflating many different levels there. So one thing is the the natural tendencies of the established economic organization when left to its own devices. Of course, it runs in a particular direction which conforms to the interests and prejudices of the elites, of the asset holders, of the owners of wealth. That's one thing. Then you say, and then there's the state. Well, the state exists with the potential to change everything. Uh, uh, it sets the terms. That's the law. Uh, and so what are the limits of politics? That's a completely different story. Uh, then you say, well, then there are pre then somehow all of these forces of faith have become internalized in us, and we are then the passive objects of this historical faith. Well, but we have the power to transcend and to resist, right? That's why we're here having this discussion. Uh, so. Uh, I think you're conflating all of this together and making it look like one big system or one big package about which we can do nothing. And the main argument that I made throughout the course is it's not like that. So theory is anti-faith. Uh, our history is a history of the subversion of these supposedly irreversible processes. Uh, and that's the role of the imagination. Uh, something seems impossible until it seems inevitable uh, in retrospect. Yes? Yeah, I think your answer will be similar, but this is a similar sentiment to the last two questions. I feel that like the state in, in all these times, you know, when discussing technology, is always playing catch up, right? In terms of whether you have this, uh, this sort of like contractual work or partial work these days with, you know, with ride sharing apps or what have you, or with, you know, financial engineering, you know, in terms of new financial products that are being devised. I think well, the state can only do so much. Well, but but I, th I think where I disagree with this line of questioning, the, these last few interventions, is I think it, it's a, not just a mistake about humanity, it's a mistake about, it's also a mistake about politics. So uh, if the degree of insecurity and precariousness in the advanced North Atlantic societies continues in this direction, eventually there's going to be vast discontent, revolt. One of the expressions of the revolt is populist reaction and the populace, in general, have no structural program. They give non-structural responses to structural problems. Uh, but all of that creates an opportunity, right? So then what is the role of the statesman? What is the role of the, of the prophet? Uh, says, there's another direction. And the prophet is only believed when he finds first installments on his plan, right? So you have, in order to believe, you have to be able to touch the wound. He has to be able to show you something. He says, this is a down payment on the alternative that I propose. That's how things change in the world. And so that's what politics is about. It's, it's, it's this rebellion against faith. It's not the mechanical enactment of what history has 
destined for us. Now, of course, I haven't come to my long-term project, but you know what the long-term is, the essence of it. It's this idea that we would change the basic terms of the decentralized access to productive resources, as in the notion of the rotating capital fund, uh, without which none of the earlier problems can be solved. In other words, these short-term and long-term, mid-term solutions set up one problem leads to another problem, and it makes the, the next level of problems imaginable. Yes? Could you expand on why attempts to revitalize the unions is a lost cause? Aren't there any means for us to revitalize unions and maybe assure their political independence? Well, uh, the, the basic reason why I think it's a lost cause is that it contradicts the, the logic of the new systems of production. So the premise of collective bargaining is this world of Fordist mass production, which has vanished. Uh, and now we have the knowledge economy concentrated in these islands, quarantined in these fringes, and everyone who's outside of it is assigned to some kind of make work uh, and is disorganized. So the fundamental social reality in the world today is that is the reality of what I called in an earlier class the subjective petty bourgeoisie. So most people in most countries in the world are poor, if not absolutely poor, then relatively poor, and their horizon of aspiration is not petty, is not proletarian, it's petty bourgeois. They aspire to modest prosperity and independence. By default, is that they they seek a small store, a small plot of land, uh, retrograde archaic family business. 